on July 25, 2012, Explore.org and Katmai National Park launched an immediate worldwide sensation. That's the first day of live streaming footage of brown bears fishing for salmon at Brooks Falls. Since then, the popularity of the beloved bear cams and the community of dedicated fans surrounding it has only grown. The bear cams have inspired annual events like Fat Bear Week and made this remote and wild national park accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Hi everyone, I'm Mike Fitz, the resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. Welcome to this special live event on the 10th anniversary of the bear cams, all brought to you by explore.org, Katmai National Park, and the Katmai Conservancy. We're here today to celebrate the cams and discuss the past, present, and future of them. And to help me in that conversation, I'm joined by three special guests all of whom who have been instrumental in the webcam's success. And I'd like to introduce them individually right now. First off, uh, just above me on your screen is Charlie Annenberg. He is the founder of explore.org. Uh, Charlie, thanks for coming back on Bear Cam and it's great to speak with you. Uh, it's great to be here. We love the bears. You know, I'm always excited to talk bear. And to the right of Charlie on my screen is Amber Kraft. She is the Interpretation and Education Program Manager at Katmai National Park and Preserve. Amber, I think this might be the first time we've actually had you on Bear Camp. So uh, welcome to the conversation. Thanks so much. Excited to be here. And finally, uh, Roy Wood is joining us as well. Longtime Bear Camp fans may recognize his face and voice. He is currently the Chief of Interpretation Education Volunteers and Youth Programs at Shenandoah National Park, but Roy had Amber's job when the bear camps first went live. So Roy, welcome back to Bear Camp. Thanks, it's so exciting to be here. So I have, a, of course, a ton of questions for my guests, uh, but I, if you have questions for our guests about the bear cams and the past and present and future of them, you can drop those in the comments. We'll do our best to try to get to a few of those during the broadcast today. I also wanna give everyone the opportunity to share maybe a favorite bear cam memory. If you have one, you can drop a short note in the comments, or if you don't have a favorite memory, but maybe you wanna just share a note on what the cams mean to you you can do that as well. So we're going to try to share a few of those things during uh, the broadcast today. My experience with the webcams now and in the past when I was a ranger at Katmai, it's really fundamentally changed my thoughts on how people can connect with national parks and nature and really what a meaningful national park experience can be. Uh, webcams like these, I think, are, are bridges to help people forge deep connections with nature. And with that uh, in mind, Charlie, I want to throw this first question out to you. What inspired you to start a platform where anyone with an internet connection can enjoy wild nature and animals? Well, uh, first, it's great to be here and to anyone listening today, you're what makes Explore special. And I'm really tickled to see Roy Wood because the journey started with Roy. And I just want to say, Roy, thank you for having the faith to allow explore.org to put the cams there because without people like Roy, Mike and Amber, we'd be, I, I don't know. Um, so these are the people really, I first would like to just share my gratitude to each one of you. I've just learned through philanthropy that we take care of what we love, it's that simple. And when you observe nature up close and personal in the purest way possible, and then you mix in minds like all three of yours, it's just an amazing equation that allows people to connect to the natural world. And what we have now 10 years later is in our own way to explore an incredible environment, our almost ecosystem of people who love the natural world, who are passionate, who are learning, who are growing. And all three of you are the stewards. I remember when I first met Roy and I said, Katmai is a, is, is a natural cathedral. That's how I looked at it, which makes you the keeper of this cathedral. It's almost like a religious thing. I mean, you're the keeper of one of these sacred places. And I'm just, you know, in awe of all of them. And there's something about the bears. And, and, and that was my way. I wanted to create an environment where for one minute, people could forget about their ills or problems, the things they're dealing with differences in life and just celebrate the beauty of this wonderful world we live in. Very well I said. I'm glad that you, you know, 
<laughs> you've given us the, you know this opportunity to share the the cameras with everybody i know it's it's meant a lot to a lot of people to have this opportunity and actually one person has written in already about what the cams mean <laughs> to them and this person wrote the bear cams have inspired me to want to become a park ranger so i don't think you can get like a higher level of gratitude than than that overall uh, uh roy the, you know when when explore.org uh, approached katmai you know talking about webcams uh you know prior to that let's back up a little bit um the park tried to host a webcam at the falls you know prior to that partnership you and i were there uh, we won't get into the details of maybe why that didn't work out but what did you learn from that experience that allowed the bear camps to become so successful uh yeah we we did try it and i think you know one of the the, the biggest lessons learned from that was was that you, you can't beat physics and you've got to have really good partners to help you with something like this you know the park service has the expertise but not the capacity to do it and we didn't have all the right connections and 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 partners for it and uh and and that was that was just a crazy day when i got this cold call from explore.org uh, i was i was packed and ready to go on vacation and uh and the call got forwarded back to me uh and uh the, the person from explore uh said uh hey we got this crazy idea uh what do you think about putting cameras in Katmai. And I said, ah, we tried that. It was really, really hard. The physics are not in our favor. And, uh, and they said, oh, we can do this. Do you, do you know us? And I, and sadly I didn't because I lived in a place with no internet. So I wasn't streaming all the other cams that they had already done, but I'm quickly trying to Google them. And I go, yeah, if they could pull off Panda cams in China, um, maybe, maybe they're up for the challenge that is Katmai and Brooks camp. Um, so, uh, yeah, that you know that was that was amazing, and and what was what was great about about trying to do it is that we had you know like you had just mentioned a few minutes ago, Mike, that we had realized during our long range interpretive plan the potential for uh, forging connections with wildlife through technology, but we just didn't have it yet. But we we you know we dreamt about it. We tried that one time, and when that didn't work, we just put that plan back on the shelf and, until that day when. Charlie and his team called me and said, "Hey, let's put cams in there." Pulled that thing back off, and we put that to, we put it all together in just a couple of months. I think that was end of February, and um, and you guys were on the ground uh, in June. So um, yeah, the you know, like I said, the getting the right partners, and 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 having all the right players in place was was key to the success here. And you know, I also want to change thank Charlie and, and explore.org because that changed my life. You know, I felt like in, in Katmai, we were like bursting with stuff that people would, would want to know about. We just didn't have a means of sharing that with the world and, and explore.org made that, that possible for us. So thank you, Charlie. You're welcome. And Amber, you've been, uh, you know, given the reins, uh, for, you know, the, for the bear cams uh in in a way you supervise the webcam rangers that we see on the cameras frequently so ranger leon and ranger kim and ranger chris this year but you also uh supervise many of the rangers that have a more traditional role at brooks camp since you're kind of like at the top of the hierarchy there and brooks camp you know is a challenging place to work um and Katmai's, you know, you still experiences, I think, a lot of the challenges that I experienced when I was a ranger there. So how are you, you know, meeting the needs of the webcam audience when uh, and, you know, meeting the challenges of like a, a Brooks camp in 2022, especially since, you know, visitation just continues to climb there? Yeah, so just to give you a little bit of a, a sense about the visitation, both through the webcam and in person. So the webcams had about 3.3 million viewers that very first year, 10 years ago. And compare that to last year, 2021, where the cams had 10.9 million viewers. So the viewership on the Explore cams has just grown and grown and grown. Um, and so has our in-person visitation. So last year in 2021, we gave Barrett orientations to a record setting 15,393 visitors at Brooks Camp. And we are right now on record to beat that number this year. Um, so visitation both online and in person has just grown exponentially in the last 10 years. 
Um, I really feel that it's important for all of Katmai visitors to have a great park experience, whether those visitors are in person or here on the ground. And we have a dedicated staff, like you just said, um, to help with those virtual audience uh, seasonal rangers, Kim and Chris this year, and our visual information specialist, Leon Law. Um, we also, at the end of the season, plan to transition one of our in-person rangers into our virtual world to help with that bear week at the end of the season. Um, they have some additional capacity uh, for that great event that happens every year. And I'm really excited. This will actually be my fourth week uh, this, this uh, October. So it's uh, really, really exciting. And there's a huge need and we have great staff that are, are working hard to meet that need for our visitors. One of the things that we're, we uh, are continuing that started you know, in the past is uh, a lot of live events um, like this one. And live events, uh, they happen to capture, I think, a lot of interesting moments about um, you know, the bear activity, or we just talk about something that's pertinent and relative, rele relevant to the world of bears and people, uh, what people are seeing on the cameras in that moment. Uh, you know, some of the things that we've been able to see, you know, sometimes on camera, at least partly on camera, was um, Holly adopting number 503 back in uh, 2014. And that was, uh, you know, this is very much a memory um, that I'll never forget. So that's somebody's favorite moment. Another favorite moment going way back, uh, Roy, was to talk about uh, Lurch and um, when he cashed a bear on the lower river and was feeding on it. Um, so that was another, someone else's um, favorite moment. Very educational, I guess. Uh, and then, of course, oh, yes, somebody, was, another. And that was early. That was the first year. Right. <laughs> that was, yeah, that, that was 2012. I think that was even before I, yeah, that was before I started doing any, any bear cam work. So, um, yeah, that was one of the, I think, more well, memorable moments from, from that first year. And, of course, uh, somebody else mentioned Ranger live chats and play-by-plays. And actually that gets to the next question that I had here in my list. And Roy, this one goes to you. Um, you know, kind of when did you first understand, you know, if you were, if we're speaking of Lurch, for instance, in that moment in 2012, uh, when did you first understand that people were really connecting with cat mice bears through the webcams and not really viewing them just as a novelty? Well, that weekend was the first time I saw the the real power of it. That was the, the um, like the October 12th weekend, something sometime around there. And, and uh, I heard about the, the potential caching and, and I went and, you know, went up to the maintenance building where the equipment was stored and sat there and watched on the cam and went like, holy cow, you know, we've got a great view with this. Um, this is a great opportunity. And I think that was the, uh, I mean, before that I had been in the, the text chat chatting fairly regularly but i just made a strong commitment that weekend to, to to try to chat with people because i was seeing the whole range of human emotions about this like this is awful this is terrible he's a murderer murderer kill him before he kills again you know uh he's a monster that sort of thing and and i made it my my goal that time to try to try to you know, chat honestly with everybody about, yes, this is, this is horrible, but let's think about it from his perspective and, you know, food and survival. And it was, it was great because by the end of that weekend, lots of people were saying, isn't he a magnificent animal? And, and look at the strength in that individual bear. And I, and I liked that sort of flipping of the narrative on him um, that, that he wasn't a monster. Um, he did, you know, that, that by our standards, that was rough, but it was just neat to see the community wanting to learn more and just, you know, thirsty for more information about it. And it was a long holiday weekend. So I, I just, you know, camped out in maintenance and chatted with people all weekend. It was good times. Um, I thought you were going to show some clip of us, Mike, back in the day, like getting chased off the beach by bears or, oh, but, or like that. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> don't get ahead <laughs> of yourself. Look at those babies. Like, <laughs> because <laughs> that that is us way back i think that's not that's, that's a clip not from the very first live event i think it might be like the second one or something like that and, is that um, the one where as soon as we got off the chat we're like you know how did we do and we start looking and the first comment was they look tired <laughs> it might have been those ones uh you know i i love doing the live events and i i hope i've gotten better at them since that time 
but I don't I don't know about you, Roy, but I I had a really difficult time adjusting to that format, staring at like the dead eye of a webcam, for instance, or a camcorder if we were out on the river and just trusting that people were listening to you at the time. That was that was really hard for me. And if you go back and watch this live chat, I think you'll you can look at my body language and see I was just not quite comfortable with it. Yeah, it, you know, it's still a little weird because I want to look at the four of your faces and then I'm looking over here and not looking at, at the camera. So those little things for me, the hardest thing was uh, Mike has been Mike's talking a long time. What do I do? Do I look at Mike? Do I look at the, the, the dead lens of the camera? Do I look at the ground? What do I do? That was always the hardest part for me. Uh, I, I guess I was enough of a ham uh, that that it. You know, it didn't it didn't bother me too much. And it was great to see the counter on the screen that would show how many people were on the chat. And you hope the number went up as long as you were talking and not and not down every time you started to talk. But those, those, are, yeah, those, those were, were fun. I was so glad we did that. That was one of, the, I think, the failures of the Park Service's first attempt is that it was a very one way thing. And when we first talked that that time with your team, Charlie, it was like, if we do this, can we be interactive with it? Can we have chats? Can we do video? And and you guys were like, yeah, whatever you want. Yeah, we can do that. It was very reassuring. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> and none of that us actually, <laughs> um, yeah, neither one of us actually went um, went swimming that day, surprisingly, we were walking around the falls. <laughs> <I know>. so. <laughs> uh, and Charlie, um, you know, we, we feel that like the I, I feel strongly that the live events are a really important part of the of the cam experience overall. But uh, Amber mentioned, you know, some incredible statistics about how, you know, the cam viewership has grown over the years. Has the popularity of the bear cams and the bears surprised you in any way? You know, it, you know when you you love your kids, you want to share it with the world. And I look at the, I feel very connected to all these bears and it just makes you so happy that they're bringing so much happiness, joy and education to the world. And I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so surprised when I see the growth and growth in all directions. I mean, growth and a global growth and all different types of people growth in generations from kids connecting to these bears now to the elderly so it's growing and spreading in all ways um so it's always a surprise but i always try to go back to the fundamentals that you know and i always say i hate to be selfish i'm just so happy that i get to observe them and then share it with such a wonderful community that is so engaged that i know that if i post something and i make a mistake or misidentify a bear in one minute, I've corrected. I mean, these people are so intelligent and so connected. It's, it's amazing. It's just, it's really incredible. And I think that's really what makes Explore so unique is the live chats and the community itself. In addition to the bears, there's a whole, like I said, ecosystem beneath it. And um, I'm just very humbled to be a part of it. Yeah, let's I actually let's talk about the community for just a little bit. Um, you know, that's something that I think is unique in a way to like the, this webcam experience and, and a lot and all the other Explore.org cams have uh, a community around that. Um, so, you know, Amber, when you're thinking about, you know, again, making uh, decisions for the park and, you know, talking with the superintendent, uh, what about the um, you know, the, the bear cam audience itself and how does that sort of, how is the, um, you know, the, the size of the audience or maybe just the engagement of audience change the way that maybe you're thinking about doing things at Katmai now and in the future? Yeah, so I think that the bear cams really help with accessibility because this is such a remote place and it's so hard for visitors to physically get here, that that accessibility that these cams allow people to make connections who would never actually be able to maybe necessarily make it. It helps people plan who are coming um, to know a little bit about what to expect and to be excited um, for the bears when they get here. Um, I think that the 
the cams are really great and a lot of the things that are doing here can be applied in lots of other places so those connections are really something that interpretation programs across the country um, strive to do to to help people connect to the resources and i think the cams do a great job at that um, we have an online community of stewards for the park in the chat. We know when something's going on. We know um, from our viewers um, if there's something that they really enjoy or there's something that they see that they don't quite think is right. We hear about it one way or another um, from all of our wonderful Bear Cam viewers out there. Um, the programming that we were just talking about, um, it's a way for people to discover something new through the live chats or they can choose to just enjoy the live feeds without um, participating in a program. It gives people choice um, to do as much or as little as they want. Um, they can be involved in the conversation or just sit back and take it all in. And people come for lots of reasons. They come to learn, they come to find with all the crazy going on in the world. Um, they experience it with their friends or family. Um, and they are able to just be in awe of these animals that are here. I mean, it is amazing to just sit and watch them and to be amused by them and amazed by them to um, also to realize that, you know, these are wild animals and they are surviving because of the largest wild sockeye salmon left in the world and because of the healthy ecosystems that exist in this place and that that's important. So yeah, I think the CAMs are amazing and do great work uh, to share that story. And of course, a lot of people um, coming up uh, in the comments with their favorite memories, someone listed, and I know this is just not one person who said this, has to be many more, but Otis coming back last year, again, he came back very late in the year, as Charlie mentioned. Uh, so I know a lot of people rejoiced when they saw him last year and he's looking really great this year. Uh, uh, favorite, another favorite memory, uh, number 128, Grazer's Yearlings, catching fish on the lip. Uh, so they were doing that last year. They're back with mom this year as two and a half year olds catching a lot of their own fish. So that's been really amazing. And then we get to see other animals on the webcams from time to time as well, such as wolves appearing on the live camps. And you can occasionally see a wolf in person at Brooks River, but you got to be really, really lucky most of the time. I can't remember seeing a wolf more than a handful of times when I was a ranger at Brooks River, but you get to see them on, on the live cams every once in a while. So you get to see so many um, different things. And um, the next question that I had, uh, I guess she, I'll, I'll address this to Amber first, because I, I had written it for you, Amber, um, but I'm curious to know what um, you, you know, Roy and, and Charlie think about this as well, but what lessons from the bear cams do you think can be applied by other national parks? I, I think going back to what I had said a little bit of just um, meeting your audience where they are, it's hard for our audience to, to get here. And so we are able to welcome people from around the world um, to Katmai through the bear cams, through the programming, giving people choice on how they want to experience, um, whether that's in the programming, in the chat, or just kind of sitting back and taking it all in. Um, I think that also having great partners um, like R Roy was saying earlier, uh, to make things like this possible, it would be very hard for the park to be able to do this on our own and having uh, explore.org as a partner um, to be able to help us with the technical expertise to make the bear cams happen um, is just amazing. Roy, Charlie, anything to add? <sighs> Well, well said. I mean, I, uh, you know, I'm just, uh, again, uh, I'm just humbled to know that the uh, place like Katmai, which I consider one of the prettiest places in the world, have the trust and faith in Explore.org to help carry their mission and their voice. And, um, you know, at other national parks, if it's Explore or whoever, there's such jewels, there's such pearls of the planet and not everyone has the blessing to be able to visit them. And if there's a way to share that message in a pure way, and let's underline that word pure and educate them, it's, it's just, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. And what I don't think people realize, so people like Amber, Roy, Mike, there's a lot behind the scenes working for the national parks. And 
a lot of things that people would like to do that they just it's hard to do and so you know explore is always here to help but it's uh you know it's truly a great honor and i know i'm not just speaking for myself but the team to know that we um are helping facilitate the vision of the stewards that are on this cam right now i mean and a much bigger network I would add also to what both of you just said about the, 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 the impact of the cams on people, because it does give people choice. It does give, it does take the park to the, to the people. Uh, and, and, but one of the things that early on, I, I just, the light bulb went on how amazing it was that the cams were also another opportunity for the people to give back to the park too. There are people that really would love to come volunteer for Amber all summer long, but they can't for a variety of reasons. But the the cams give them opportunities to do that because they can be cam ops, the amazing cam ops that get skilled at tracking bears as they move every direction and anticipating where they're gonna be. And that was a great opportunity for people to volunteer. And the people that keep the, uh, you know that that are in the chat all the time and keep that conversation going and when they would when we would do the live chats and they drop in maps for us or photos and help us like illustrate our 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 chats and 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 i hadn't really thought about that until it just started happening i mean charlie you guys had the the cam ops thing going um before that so that wasn't so, sort of an organic thing that just happened as far as i was concerned but i just thought that was such a powerful way to uh, allow people to volunteer and give back to the park and to give back to the community so two thumbs up for cam ops i agree yeah it's been wonderful to see you know the development of the community and all those different aspects of that and we're gonna um you know try to get to some audience questions of course I do have, you know, just three more questions collectively for um, my guests. And if you're, you know, just tuning in right now, I'm joined by Charlie Annenberg, who's the founder of Explore.org, Amber Kraft, who is the Interpretation and Education Division Lead at Katmai National Park, and Roy Wood, who is the Chief of Interpretation, Education, Volunteers, and Youth Programs at Shenandoah National Park. We're talking about the 10-year anniversary of the bear cams, and what it meant in the past, what it means now and where it might take us in the future. So this next question is for all three of you. I guess I'll, I'll ask the question and I'll give my, uh, one of the things that pops into my brain when, I'm, when I think about it, so you have a little bit of time to think about it, but uh, what is one of the more challenging moments that you've witnessed or experienced on the cams? And there are many that I can think of. Um, Actually, just the other day, uh, not just the other day, but it was coming up on two weeks ago now, um, two and a half weeks ago, something like that. There was a, an incident with uh, a large adult male, 856, and a mother bear and her two young cubs. And we haven't seen the mother bear since, um, but the, the male really beat up um, mother. And then he ended up chasing the cubs for a round. So we don't know the resolution of that event, the ultimate resolution. So we haven't seen mom or those cubs on the camera since then, and the rangers haven't seen them. But those situations are always challenging, I think, from my perspective to interpret. They're, they're interesting sort of like to watch from a detached, a, a, like a, an emotionally detached perspective like Spock would try to do. I'm always, you know, putting myself in, in that frame of mind when I'm watching, when I'm, when I'm trying to watch the bears. But it's difficult um, to remove yourself emotionally from those situations. And then, um, you know, knowing that some for a lot of people, that's like the first time maybe they, they tuned into the cams like 10 minutes beforehand. And the, oh my, and, the, and this is what they're seeing for the first time. So going, you know, you know taking a step back and, and remembering that I'm not just talking to, you know, the hardcore fan who was there on July 25, 2012, and has been watching ever since, but I'm also talking to brand new people on a daily basis. And that evening I was like five minutes from going to bed. Um, when that when that happened, uh, I thought, well, I'll just check the bear cams one more time. Maybe there's like a bear hanging out on the uh, catch a fish or whatever. And I, you know, and I jumped on and I and I saw that. So I had to spend a you know another hour and a half um, staying up and working. But those are always like the the challenging moments for me. Uh, again, I don't I'd have this um, specifically directed to anybody, so you're all welcome to jump in. But yeah, what's been one of the more challenging moments? I guess um, to build off what you're saying, beyond the, like the hard realities of the life of bears, of them being injured or dying, and um, p 
people wanting the park to intervene on behalf of those bears. Um, you also have not as dramatic, but just as important sort of um, challenges like technical issues with power because it's cloudy on top of Dumpley Mountain or cleaning the underwater bear cam because um, there are bears there and it's very hard to get there with all of the bears there. But luckily we were able to do that for you all. And it's a beautiful picture once it's clean, but uh, there are challenges with just be the location of where we are uh, beyond the realities of the life of a bear as well. Yeah, I, uh, come on, Mike loves to clean the underwater bear camp. <laughs> Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, no, all, all of the above. I mean, obviously technical because the fans are so connected. Um, animal death is always challenging on, on any of the cams. You know, I'm someone who would like to think that life's a Disney movie myself and hope not to see it. What I like to share with the audience though is that when you do see it or are close to something that's challenging to it, it's really a testament to the cams because it shows you how you've developed an emotional connection to the natural world and to these animals to the point that if someone gets injured or harmed, you're truly emotionally connected. Whereas think about it, if you had never watched the cams and you said, Oh, 856 attacked a bear in Katmai, Alaska. You just look at me like, what? And walk on. So, you know, I wish it could all be, uh, you know, the Disney movie, but that's not the natural world and that's the power of the camps. And so it's always challenging, but that's how I always remind myself. And then my third one, when you just say stressful, and luckily there hasn't been too many mishaps, when some of the moms take their babies out, like nine, 10 and her baby up at Brooks about three weeks ago, and you see the other bears coming in and the river's roaring, and this bear is trying to stay connected. Oh, my heart beats so fast, because that's what I'm expecting, a disaster. The, either another bear is gonna attack the baby or she's gonna fall off the river. And so I find those seeds to be incredibly stressful. And, and that happens every year where you know some of these moms will get on the lip and the babies follow them and last year it was like right under the lip and there's all these other big bears around so you know there's always an element that happens every year um and then the fourth was i remember even last year obviously there was otis but last year the salmon run happened very late and you know for the first few weeks you were starting like oh my god this is going to be a disaster like there's no bears people are going to start thinking the bears are starving and and so there's always little contingents but overall it's somehow it all seems to work out um you know and that's the natural world we live in and charlie or excuse me roy looking back then at, at the bear cam and your experience you have like a, a a moment that you feel was particularly challenging well, the the death of the death of any bear, like like you guys have both talked about, um, but for me the 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 hardest one was uh, oh this is terrible though it just occurred to me I don't remember the, the the numbers of the bear but the the cub dying slowly from the adenovirus the canine adenovirus oh, was, yeah, four five uh, one four five one and and. I think it would be easier if, you know, a uh, T-Rex swooped in and, and killed a bear to interpret that, like it was over like that. But to watch an animal die over the course of hours or days, the, the starvation or the near starvation of cub adult when he got abandoned, you know, I think those were really challenging to interpret because I also wanted to grab a nice salmon and take over to help cub adult out or, or, you know, to, to fly the vet, the veterinarian out to take a look at the, at the sick bear. So that was hard to, to interpret that in a, in a caring, empathetic way to, to people who maybe cared more than, than I did. And that sounds terrible saying it that way, but, you know, I also have the Spock like mentality too until it comes to watching an animal die slowly, slowly over days. And so those were those were really hard, but I think the cams really did come into their own during those two uh, events too. We, I mean, the cub adult one turned out well for everybody toward the end. Um, the other one didn't, except that we, uh, you know, we, we learned more about disease 
in the bear population of Brooks Camp. And uh, we got to talk a lot about park service philosophy, you know, about it not being a bear farm that we respect all the natural processes and and um, and we can learn from this. And, uh, you know, in the case of cub adult, the you know, people that wanted uh, that had talked about maybe we should catch him and take him to a zoo or something. And then other people would say, yes, but he deserves a chance to survive by his strength and his guile and his intelligence. And, and so I, I, I like that, but, but those were tough. Those, those were stressful uh, times to in, interpret. And for, uh, uh, I don't know, are, I, were you thinking of those two, Mike? Uh, you were around, I mean, we were in the same room together, <laughs> training, trying to pay attention to our training while we were trying to interpret the, they, yeah, that's yeah. that is one of the things that um, I, I often and I'm sure Amber, you've experienced this as well. But when you're a park ranger, you're trying to juggle like 100 different duties at the same time. So Roy and I were to make a long story short. When that cub went ill, we, we were in Anchorage. We we're supposed to be doing some mandatory website work. We we're supposed to be devoting like three days just to like the park website or whatever. And then this cub dies on camera. So we're like, okay, well, we can kind of get some of this other work done, but I don't think either of us could really um, no. uh, devote as much time to that event as we wanted to. And then I was like scheduled to go on vacation the day it died or whatever. So Roy was just like kind of left alone to figure things out on on his own. But um, yeah, those are those are challenging things. And I know Amber that you know when things come up on the cameras, you know Rangers aren't watching twenty four seven, so that's also like a real real challenge as well. <laughs> I like, mm -hmm. you know that there's someone snorkeling up at the falls right now? <laughs> oh yeah, we did have to do that again too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so going from challenge now, um, we'll talk uh, to uh, about a favorite memory. And before I get to that, again, some there's some people talking about what the cams mean to them. Uh, they, somebody wrote in, this is a healing place and it's exciting every year. Thank you to all who make it possible. Uh, somebody wrote what it means to me. Um, I, you know, was diagnosed with MS and I found the CAMS uh, and now I roll in here and I watch um, ex Explore.org every day. Uh, I, I could, another person wrote, I could get to know that, that learning about the individual bears is important to them. And that's something that we've tried to emphasize because it's a really unique opportunity to get to know wild animals on an individual level. And in 2017, someone said, I shattered my heel and broke my collarbone in five places. Couldn't do anything but sit. Found the bears and the rest is history. So we're glad that you're still a part of the webcam uh, experience. Uh, for This is also a question for everybody. But, uh, you know, we went from a challenging moment um, to let's go to a favorite moment. So uh, what is, you know, one of your favorite moments on the cams? And to start, I'll say... It's really the times when the bears proved me wrong. And I can think of that instance in 2014 when uh, Cub Adult, who's now primarily known as 503, was separated from his mother, um, sort of like a natural mother and cub sub separation event. I didn't really realize it at the time, uh, but it's just a year later, and that's a year younger than we see most cubs in Katmai get separated. And people were asking me, do you think it's going to get adopted? Do you think it's going to get adopted? I, get that, I got that question probably 100 or a thousand different times and each time i was like ah don't count on it it happens in brown bears don't count on it. don't count on it and then <laughs> and then what happened is that well he got adopted so i i love those moments when the bears prove me wrong because uh, we learned so much from those individual um animals but what about what about the rest of you what's uh what's been one of your favorite moments i love when the bears make me laugh so 128 grazers cubs um, maybe two years ago, we're up on the lip of the falls with her and they like one at a time slipped off the falls and started floating down the river. And she looks up and like, what's going on? And then runs down and starts to chase them to make sure that they are okay. I don't know why, but just it, it makes me laugh. It makes me smile. And those, those moments, um, where they do that, or when the bears come really close to investigate the cans and they're licking them or smelling them, or you see the inside of their mouths real up close. Um, those are, uh, those kinds of moments that, that just kind of make me giggle and make me smile are, are definitely favorite moments for, for me on the bear cams. Oh. I don't know. I love, I love, 
all the moments. And I, I just like just looking at the highlights you just showed. I do have a soft spot for the moms and the Cubs. Uh, they're just, I don't know of anything more heroic. I, I watch these moms, the way they take care of their babies, Cubs, Goys, I'm not correct all the time in my terminology, feeding, protecting, loving, nurturing, and they are just the definition of selfless heroes. And I, I watch it year in and year out. I That one moment when I first noticed it with Velcro was pretty beyond. And then I love when they follow them swimming, the nursing, you know, obviously anything Otis. Um, Otis has really grown on me. I, I, I don't even know how he's with us today and yet he's still doing it. 747, Razor is so tough. There's some very handsome, growing young generations. And I, I, I think that's one of the things that that's really caught me as we talk about the 10 year anniversary is that I'm growing with these bears. I'm, I'm really concerned about some of the elderly bears. And yet I'm also getting to know their offspring and the new generation. I mean, it really is like a family and it's, it's the weirdest thing. Um, I don't know how I'm going to handle, you know, we talked about that. Some of the elderly bears perhaps passing. I don't even, I don't even want to discuss it. And yet there's this whole new, generation and, and I they all have such unique personalities if you get to study them and um, favorites I mean obviously anything falling off the falls I mean I think Chunk's face and character he's one of the funniest bears I've ever seen and Walker is just a specimen and I was saying how 747 every morning he takes if you're up about 730 it's like an old man taking a cold plunge he just saunters into the water same spot every day takes his spot um, some of these little bears are just rascals. I mean, this new bear that hides under the, it's almost a new thing. He hides under the Brooks Falls lip and is catching bears. I didn't see that four or five years ago. And he has mastered a new sport. Anytime they get on their hind legs is, is incredible. And when they're goofballs, of course, like itching on the trees. So I could go on and on. I, like I said, I, you know, I just, I, I think it's just all wonderful. Too many good moments to say one. I should open my phone and show you the thousands of good moments I have clipped. I mean, it could go on and on. I mean, what about the sunrises at Katmai when you see them walking in the sunset or sunrise? Pearl of the Another planet. One this morning, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Roy? Favorite moment or moments? Oh, uh, you know, I, I, I liked... I had so much fun doing the chats. I liked the, the, you know, trying to like find the, 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 the more unusual places to do them. Uh, we weren't always successful, but <laughs> like in the river or out on the spit. And, and I, I just thought that was fun because I felt we could, you know, it, it's just shining a, a, a light on a different part of the, of the, the park there, you know, and having the mobile unit and being able to move it out on the beach and 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 tried uh different locations of course what comes with that is the oh my god oh my god oh my god we're going to be late uh this bear is in the way they're not budging we're going to be late or <laughs> we just get everything set up and we're ready to to start and a bear comes in and we have to pick everything up and move to to a different location or the ones where we were just about to finish and we had to just cut it grab it and run um but th those those were fun and i you know uh I know I drove you nuts, Mike, with the, come on, let's do it here. It'd be really cool to take the, the Johnny Five down by the river. And and uh, you're like, can't we just sit inside? Where? <laughs> no, you weren't that bad. But but it was, uh, th those were fun. That, that was always pushing the envelope like that, I thought, was a, was a blast. And, and uh and, and I, if you hadn't taken the, 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 you know, the cub adult moment, that was, that was top there. When, when he showed a backup uh, with Holly and it was obvious that, that she had adopted him, that, that was just amazing. Yeah, just like, you know, Charlie was saying about how we're watching these bears grow up over time. I think that's one of the amazing things about the cameras is we get to see cubs bringing back, you know, bears that we saw as cubs first coming back with their own offspring. 
and or just maturing into very large bears like 503 is doing. So I, I, I love that aspect of this. It, you just can't do that in, um, you know, in other national parks most of the time. You don't have that level of knowledge or, or that opportunity. So I love that overall. And, and you guys final were question. talking about Bear 94. Uh, I think I think Bear 94, uh, if if the idea is right, was uh, one of the first bears I ever saw at Brooks Camp because she was out nursing on the spit with her mother when I got off the plane. And I think, so I didn't, I didn't know that, but when we were talking earlier, I, 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 I Googled her, you can type in cat my bear 94 and it's the top hit. Amazing. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. <laughs> no, that's, 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 you know, that's a, um, a great segue, I think, cause, uh, or a great point because it, you know, the part of the community of this um, is that the, there, there are bear camp fans who, have devoted I don't know how many hours of their own time to to document what the camera or what the bears are doing on a wiki and if you want to look that stuff up you can get a life history of a lot of these different bears very very easily so it's no longer just information that's accessible to like a few biologists and rangers at Brooks River it's really accessible to anybody again who has that internet connection and hopefully we'll see one of 94's comes coming back in the future as a successful adult um, there's, you know, one of my last questions for everybody actually was asked by a viewer and it's, uh, this is for everybody, but Charlie, they wanted to ask you specifically about this. So I'll throw it to you first. What would you like to see or plan for the future of the cams at Brooks? Well, you know, this is where I have to be careful in, in be respectful of the parks, um, I would love each year to have the opportunity to name some of the sub adults that are becoming adults and have a kind of a collective contest. I think the bears are more than numbers and I struggle each year. Um, I just love, I, I just love these bears and in my head, I have my own nicknames for them, but I don't even share it on the community because I'm like, Oh no, I need to be politically correct. I think that, each year is unique and I don't even know how to make it better because the bears are already perfect to me and, and we have a great team here and Cat Mai is perfect. It's been around for millennial and I just hope as I age and become a grumpy old bear that I could become still be a part of this team because, um, you know, I, I just love this time of year. I love even Mike looking behind your screensaver on math, I don't have my bear behind me. Like I, I love watching these bears. Um, and uh, I, I'm always open to suggestions, explores mantras, never stop learning. And so please people, the audience share with us what you think would make the experience better. Um, I have a few ideas, but uh, you know, it's a small team and I always have to be really respectful because the commitment that not just these three people, but behind the scenes, deeper and deeper from the cam ops, the moderators, my staff make, I, I try to always be respectful of their time as well. And, but it's a great community. But I would like to name a few bears. I don't deny it. I, that's my one thing. If I had one wish, I, I just think it'd be fun. Sorry. Uh, and Amber, <laughs> Amber or Roy, um, you know, do you, what, what about you? Do you, uh, you know, have, um, you know, something on your wish list maybe, or just, um, you know, a way of, do you, that you think like the cams can evolve into something different and better in the future? Well, I would say that our strong partnership continues, that we're able to continue to reach audiences around the world with the message of the importance of these wild places and the healthy ecosystems. And I keep thinking with as much crazy as in the world these days, every time you turn on the news or every time you turn around, it seems like there's there's some other just crazy happening someplace. And with all the worry and the stress and the gloom and the doom that people are finding themselves in that these cams and this place offers hope and happiness and almost like the bear. So most of the time, brown bears are solitary, um, but Brooks Camp and Katmai is really a special place because these solitary bears, they, they come together because of the abundance of salmon. They come together um, to 
feast on the salmon in relative coexistence, like they get in their kerfluffles, but they tolerate each other for the most part. And I hope, um, and this is going to sound kind of cheesy, but I hope that humanity can do the same, that they can come together and that they can do the same as the bears and kind of the issues that are important, um, climate change and, and healthy ecosystems and other things, we can all be brown bears and find our, 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 our common goal, that salmon, um, and, and work together towards that. And hopefully that these cams offer that as a window of insight to people around the world. So it's a little cheesy, but that's what I think. <laughs> Anything to add, Roy? You're looking at me? Like, why would I try to top <laughs> that? That was perfect. So, <laughs> let's get to questions well, from the from the yeah. public. Yeah. <laughs> well, very yeah, very well said. You know, um, sorry, it is hard to top that that um, those words, Amber. So, thank you so much for for sharing that. I I, I share your your goal there. Um, you know, we've I've been talking with you know Charlie Annenberg and Amber Kraft and Roy Wood. We're talking about the anniversary of the 10 year anniversary of the bear cams on explore.org and our partnership with Katmai National Park. We do have, um, you know, again, some more favorite moments to share and also um, some viewer questions as well. So someone's favorite moment, Lefty leaping from the lip. And we actually revisited that moment on our YouTube channel. So if you want to, you know, get a little retrospective on that, you can find that on explore.org's um, YouTube channel. So that was always, you know, wonderful to see. Somebody else wrote, the bear cams helped us get through the first pandemic summer of 2020, giving us an ever-changing window into the wild, wacky, wonderful world of bears and salmon. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, so many different memories to share. I'm going to go back uh, to the top of my list here uh, because somebody asked about uh, a question, are there any bears that were that were here in 2012, and I think they're asking, are they are they still around right now? And I, I was just off the top of my head, I can list um, several. So we have we've mentioned 747. He was a much younger, but still a very large adult male at that time. So he was around. Number 856 was around. Number 402 was around. Number 94 was around. Uh, let's see. Um, Walker was around, although he was much smaller at the time. Number 503 was around, although he was also much smaller at the time. Chunk was around as an adult male. Of course, Otis was around as what we at the time, Roy and I thought was an old bear, but he probably wasn't that old at the time. He just acted <laughs> super old <laughs> at the time. So a lot of a lot of bears uh, are still kicking around the river 10, 10 years later. Um, so yeah, it's a... It's a something that speaks to their longevity and their ability to survive and, and what can be a really challenging environment um, overall. Uh, but another viewer question here, this one is for uh, Amber, actually. Uh, what does the, the, and I know you touched on this during the broadcast, but um, maybe you can talk about it uh, a little bit differently or maybe more specifically, what does the park see as the benefit of having a large online visitorship you know a lot of national parks like yellowstone i mean they get visit people visiting in the millions and millions of people or roy's at shenandoah now where close to very large cities and millions of people visit katmai's a different beast um you know very remote very expensive to get to very difficult to get to so what's the benefit of having a large online viewership to to katmai Oh, we can't hear you, muted. Amber. So, yeah, you may have muted yourself accidentally. Sorry, excuse me. Can you hear me okay. now? Yes. Um, so, I think that it's important to be able to um, help to bring this place to folks who wouldn't be able to experience it otherwise. National parks belong to the American people. Um, and as such, it's important to make them as accessible as possible. So, um, this national parks across the country tell the story of what it means to be an American. What do we value? What do we feel are important to preserve, to interpret, to um, leave for this and for future generations? And so by making this place accessible, we are in part fulfilling the mission of the National Park Service. So preservation and access, and they are 
conflicting in our mission for the National Park Service. And these online viewers help to make that mission possible. There is a carrying capacity for these places and having people being able to experience it around the world without having to actually come does help to meet that mission. It helps us to protect the resource. It helps us to uh, be able to make the resource available. And I think that is important to the park to share this special place with as many people as possible. Yeah, well said. I, I have argued recently that national parks in a way aren't fully accessible spaces because of the barriers that people face when they try to visit them in person, whether that's a physical barrier or, you know, mental wellness or money or time or family obligations or whatever it happens to be, you know, even though national parks are experiencing, you know, very high levels of visitation, there are many, many more people who don't get to experience them in person. And, and the webcams help to sort of bridge those barriers in many ways. And I'm, I'm proud to be part of, of that effort and, and help people, you know, share, share those experiences. Uh, question for Roy. Uh, do you still watch the cams sometimes and keep up with the bears of the old day? Uh, I watch them sometimes, not very often, because uh, despite living 80 miles from D.C. and four miles from a Walmart, I don't have wired Internet at my house. So I'm satellite Internet or cell phone Internet. So it's not very good. It's expensive. And so, no, I don't watch them uh, as often as I'd like to. Uh, I, I tuned in a little bit last night just to, to, to see the different camera views uh, and, and how they were, how they looked. And, but no, I don't get to watch them all that, that much. It's kind of sad. Oh, I understand that too. Um, living in some remote spots after I left my, my position at Katmai as a ranger, it's, it was dif difficult to keep up with the bears and just reading actually the comments helped me sometimes because I could do that and sort of keep up with things in a, in a way when, um, you know, streaming the cameras was too bandwidth heavy for the connections that I, that I used to have. Uh, another question uh, here, um, and this is, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits, I think, of the cameras that we haven't noticed uh, or, or that I certainly didn't envision when I first started bec becoming involved in the, the webcams is somebody was wondering about any new research come, has any new research come from the cameras? And uh, yes, there, there are. Um, right now, there's a, a couple of things I can think of off the top of my head. There's some surveys that I've been involved with, with um, uh, researchers who are looking at uh, the, the importance of individual animals to like the webcam experience and connecting with the species as a whole. So there, we did those surveys in 2019 and 2020, and um, you know my research colleagues are still really, kind of really going through that data to try to publish more of that information. So that was that's an exciting thing that we're looking at because we're finding that if you can connect with an individual animal on the camera, that connection is extremely strong, and it's sort of like a gateway drug in a sense. Maybe that's a bad metaphor to use, but you want to know more if you can identify Holly, for instance, who's another bear that's still kicking around from 2012. She's still here today. I didn't mention her she was around on the camera today and uh if you can identify holly and who can forget that <laughs> that moment there um then you you know you might want to know more about other bears and then you want to know more about brown bears in general and then you might care about brown bears not only in katmai but on uh on kodiak island or or you know grizzly bears in the lower 48 so it i think it does help to establish sort of like a sense of, of caring for um, the animals um, that you see uh, all over you know, uh, the continent. And then another aspect of the research that I can think of is um, one that I've mentioned before on the cameras, but that's the Bear ID project, and that's facial recognition technology, working to identify wildlife. So instead of having to like collar a bear, for instance, uh, and, and track it through GPS, maybe there's a point in the future where that sort of research can be supplemented or even su supplanted uh, in, in some places with trail cams that uh, are in, in camera or computer software that is equipped to recognize the individual faces of brown bears and we can track them on the landscape. And, uh, and some of the, you know, the, the webcams could be a part of that in the future. And I think that would be, that would be really, really great. Uh, uh, one, um, 
Oh, one, this is a fun question for everybody. I don't know who I'm going to ask this to first. So I guess whoever wants to jump in first is welcome to. Uh, which bear are you most like? So pick a bear cam bear and think about which one is most like like you do you have a, a is most like your personality i i really do have to think about this this is a a difficult um question overall i would like to say that you know i'm well liked so i'm like five five zero three but that <laughs> may not be the case there probably are a lot of people who are like mike will you just stop talking right now uh, <laughs> um, but what about what do, what, what do the rest of you think <laughs> Uh, well, I feel a lot like 410 these days, 410 in her latter years, eat and then just drop wherever you are and sleep and then wake up and eat and drop right there again and, and sleep some more. Not the most fun bear out there, but uh, I would have I would have said uh, uh, diver because of snorkeling, but I didn't ever know diver. We do have actually some some. Um... A, a couple of bears that are that have a propensity to dive now, a, a young adult male number nine zero three who's been doing that, and that's been kind of fun. And sometimes we'll see Holly actually right in front of the underwater camera dive down for fish, which is which is kind of incredible. So these are like the moments that you know for me are, are just so special to watch on the cameras because well, you know even in person you don't get to see that perspective. So those are those are really remarkable. But uh, Amber and Charlie, I'm not going to force you to the, answer you know, this question, but you can think about it. But yeah, go ahead, Roy. Sorry. Do you remember the first time we saw the bear snorkel by, or not snorkel, but paddle by the? Yeah, and we were like, oh, that's how their legs look underwater when they're doing that because you can't really <laughs> tell from above. No, you can't. Not at all. It doesn't, it doesn't really look like that. Uh, but yeah, Amber, Charlie, do you have a, a bear that you would consider <laughs> yourself to be most like? So I don't know how well it fits, but I'm going to say Holly in the way that she raised her cub. And the cub was always there and she was teaching her things, but she also let her cub uh, have enough rope to kind of get herself into trouble as far as the porcupine quills and things like that. So when I am working with staff here at Katmai, I hope that I am able to be a good mentor but I also hope that they have enough space that they're able to try new things and um, get themselves into a little bit of trouble every now and then. That's an impossible question. I mean, I've <laughs> a hybrid. I have a hybrid of them all. I sometimes when I look at their gut, I feel like a blend of seven four seven and Walker. I just kind of identify to loving to eat and those big bellies. Some of a uh, I really been enjoying some of Otis's siestas this season, and so I might have to throw him into my mix. I know I'm moody, so I definitely have Grazer in me because I'm known to swipe at people if you get on my nerves. So I got to throw her in there as well. Um, Grazer has much more tolerance. I'd already tell those two bears to get lost, you know, after two and a half years. I'm so impressed that she's you know, working with them. So, and, uh, you know, obviously the, yeah, I mean, the infamous Holly shot when she won Fat Bear that year, I, that that kind of sums up bears in general. But, um, and the clumsiness of junk. I mean, the way that when he rolls over in the river, if you put me in the river, I'd be rolling over too, losing my balance and uh, losing it. So uh, I just, a blend, a little of each, I think. Yeah, that'd be me, you know, trying to get position and falling over. <laughs> yeah, tough question, great question, um, a hard one to answer. I think we could we could debate this. I think even further uh, as well. We're a little past um, the hour, and um, it's been a, a, you know a really fun conversation. There's just one more question on here that I want to answer from everybody or for everybody, and that's. Somebody is wondering what's the best way for us to support the bear camps. And, uh, you know, one thing that I'll say is, of course, just to watch and share what you uh, experience on the bear camps. Uh, you know, one of the ways that we can help protect national parks is make sure that people are, you know, simply aware 
of these places and because not everyone is so you know you can you can share your experience with other people talk about you know the the bears that you've seen share the importance of the salmon run in bristol bay and the importance of protecting that because they are the keystone of this whole thing we wouldn't be here none of us would be talking here today without those fish and then if you're looking to donate monetarily you can also look to the katmai conservancy and you can find them at katmaiconservancy.org which is the official uh, friends group of katmai national park um, it's been such a, a great conversation i've had a lot of fun joining my my four guests today um, so maybe uh, coming up in five years or 10 years, we'll have to do another one. Maybe we'll have uh, an even larger panel at that time to talk about the past and the present and the future of the, the bear camps. So I want to thank my guests uh, individually for everything that they've done to help make the bear camps a success. Again, uh, we were talking uh, or, or right above me, uh, ch talking with Charlie Annenberg. He is the founder of explore.org. So thanks so much, Charlie, for being here and taking the time to, to talk with us about how much you love the bears. Uh, you're welcome and let's do it more often. I, I can talk bear anytime. So I can talk very good about bears <laughs> anytime. <laughs> And uh, also we've been talking with Amber Kraft, the Interpretation and Education Program Manager at Katmai National Park. And Amber, thanks for, so much for your support and putting up with me uh, and making your staff available on the bear camp. So thanks again. For sure. And last, Roy Wood has also joined us. He's the Chief of Interpretation, Education, Volunteers and Youth Programs at Shenandoah National Park and had Amber's job when the bear camps first went live and actually did a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to allow me to make good mistakes. So I learned a lot um, during those first <laughs> few years of bear camp. So so Roy, thanks so much for uh, for joining me and uh, and being back on the camps. Oh, my pleasure. And, and thanks to all three of you for, you know, Charlie for getting them started, Amber and Mike for carrying the torch, you know, on to the next generation. And uh, it's just a, a been a pleasure and an honor working with all of you guys. And thanks to everyone at explore.org who works behind the scenes to make the bear cams and our other webcams a reality. They do, there's a ton of work that they do that doesn't, um, you know, really get advertised, but they do incredible work and do a lot of things that I could not do. And thanks to the moderators in the chats, uh, the camera operators who collectively volunteer thousands of hours each year to drive the cams. And then finally, thanks to all the people who love Katmai and will work to protect wild spaces such as this. We need you now more than ever. And my name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. Thanks for watching today, and here's to the next 10 years of Bear Camp. Thank you.